so important. We looked into that a few weeks ago. And as I mentioned before, that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the very core, the very core of our faith, our belief, and our hope as Christians. And that what separates us from religions. Religions have no living hope. We're Christians, we have a living hope because we have a living God, Jesus Christ. So always remember that, Christian. This is a very important for us to understand this and for us to know and to live in it. It is the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very power of our Christian life. Did you hear that, Christians? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very power. You know what power is? What energizes you, what, what gives you purpose, it gives you the, the, the excitement about living in Christ. That is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important. And also, it is very vital for us and for Christians, for everyone, and including you, if you're here today, you've been contemplating about Christianity, about Jesus Christ. It is very important for you guys, for all of you, to know and to understand the significance of this res of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and why is it that this is have to be the reality of our daily lives. A couple weeks ago when I spoke about this, I, I asked you, do you believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is a living God? Do you believe that? Yes. Yeah. Do you believe that He rose from the dead? Yes. yes. <laughs> For a moment, I thought about this. Some reason, I went. I remember I went to a, a, a black church in America. Man, I tell you, you're so excited. You know what? Because you're like, yes, preacher, yes. You know, they are like really excited about it. We're we're there like, <laughs> hey, it's all right to get excited. Do you, do you really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is a living God? Yes. yes. All right, that's good. There you go, Sarah. You got it. <laughs> but here's the thing. How real is the living Christ in your daily lives? Do you really talk with Him? Do you really walk with Him? Is He always there in every decision that you make? Now God said that He's always with us, right? He never leave us nor forsake us. That's His promise and it is always true. But the question is, how often are we to remember that Christ is with us and that He is a living God and we are to consider Him in every moment of decisions we make? That makes a big difference. Huge difference. Unfortunately, many are living in this so-called to be a Christian and yet living in this you know, fantasy we call it. Things that are not real. They got involved so much into this, much of the influence of the world that the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is becoming less and less in our lives. There's always this idea of belief. To believe. There's a, listen to this. Who you believe, who you believe will make who you are and what you are. Let me say it again. Who you believe will make or who you will make who you are and what you are. And that is very true. Even those people out there that do not believe in Jesus Christ, they have a belief. Even the atheists that say there is no God, they even have a belief. They believe there is no God. They believe that things could just happen on its own. They believe that man can live independently from God. A belief. A belief. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you do have a belief. My question to you is this. How is that with your belief so far? Does it really, is it really real? Are you, are you hopeless still in that? 
in your life, not knowing what is that believe really for sure or not. This last week I read an article in the newspaper and the New Zealand Herald, one of the icons of New Zealand, uh, and a sportsman, uh, he, he uh, had to, went through a depression and I believe that he committed suicide. He was 28 years old, I believe. That was on Tuesday or Wednesday when I read that paper. And uh, I look at the comments of people making comments in regards of, you know, he was a great man who, was a, who loved lives, you know. Or he, he will do anything. He was a very active man, very active. And a lot of his friends in the uh, tweeters and all that saying that, you know, he, he, it's awesome always to be around him. He's, he's of so much love. You love life, he said. But my question in my heart is, if he loved life so much, why did he end his life? There is something that man is so easily deceived to think that they believe in what they are now and in what they do, who they believe, is so real that actually it's hopeless. Only in Jesus Christ that that belief is truly alive, that faith is real. John Phillips, one of my favorite commentators in the Bible, he said that belief always determines behavior. Belief always determines behavior. What you do, what you think, is because of who you believe and what you believe. So my question is, this morning, before we get into the word, who do you believe? In common, usually people say, I believe in myself. And even the school, they encourage students to have self, self, what? Esteem. It's calling you self-belief. They said that the sky is the, the limit. But a lot of people, before they get to the sky, when they're still on earth, they have no clue what's going to happen or what hope they can have. Christians, this morning, this message is very much for you, as it is also for those who do not know Christ. But one thing I want to pray, I'm pray, I've been praying when I prepared this message. In this next five verses, we're going to look into it in 1 uh, Corinthians 15. That you would experience the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your life. That you are not just to come Sunday to be a Christian, Sunday Christians. That you will be Christ followers every single moment of your life and to experience the power of God that you're not just like you know oh yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to Sunday how about looking forward to every day to be with God to live with him let me just remind you before we read in this verses last week we look at chapter 15 verse Corinthians verse 12 to verse 28 in verse 12 to verse 19 we found the power and the resurrection of Jesus Christ it is the power, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power of God, it is the substance of our faith, and it is the evidence of our hope. And then we look at the pursuit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in verse 20 to verse 28, in that we find that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God pursues eternal life for those who are in Christ. It means that eternal life is not just life after death. Eternal life begins the moment that you know Christ, Christ in you, that is eternal life. And many of us in this room, we are living in eternal life right now. And then, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God pursues His kingdom. His kingdom to be established in the life of His people here and on the second coming of Christ when He returns. He will come back. And now we look at verse 29 to verse 34. Let's look at that verse if you would with me as I read it. I want you to follow along with me in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29 to verse 34. Let's read it. As I read it out loud, follow along with me if you would. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. 
If in the manner of men I have fought with the beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Away to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this in, uh, to your shame. Let's pray. Father God, in the next few moments, we do ask once again for your Holy Spirit to intervene in our minds and our hearts. To give us understanding and to give us also the, your very heart to be in our hearts. God, I pray that the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ will be truly the power of our lives. That we will have that to be in our reality daily. And for us to see, to experience Jesus Christ in our lives. So may these words that we are going to observe together be alive in us and to live for us to live in. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Today we're going to look at the last part of this, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, paragraph, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the motivations of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the motivations of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is kind of the way of when the rubber meets the road, when things become uh, becoming more and more real to us. We're going to look at, first of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ motivates us to submit our life, our lives to Him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ will, will motivate us to submit our lives to Him. Verse 29, this is one of the reasons why many pastors do not like to preach 1 Corinthians. This verse 29 has been a very controversial verse that through the centuries I've read so many different commentaries and none of them can really be dogmatic about it. But one thing we know, it is not what some people assume to be. If you look at it again with me, that verse, it says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? Who are baptized for the dead? In the, in the hermeneutics, which is the, the art of interpreting the Bible, we call this text is an obscure text, or this is something that um, there is no other places in the Bible that really speaks of this verse, if you know what I mean. Okay, meaning that when you look at this by itself, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? Does that mean that someone's alive here today can be baptized for the one who already died? In my study, I discovered that there are some Christian movements or so-called Christian movements that believe in that very, the very idea of baptizing what they call it baptism by proxy. Let me read this quote that I got from the book again by John Philip to say, historically, baptism for the dead was practiced by heretical cults such as Serentians and Marconians. Both Tertullian and Castotum, and you say, like, what is that? Don't worry about it. Mention the practice. Now listen, baptism for the unbelieving dead, a further stage is gross error is one of the main dogmas of present-day Mormons who make an enormous things of it. Gordon H. Fraser, an expert on Mormonism, says that the Mormons are constantly doing work for the dead by compiling genealogies, compiling, excuse me, compiling genealogies of their ancestors and other notables and then being baptized for them. The Mormons are very serious about all of this. One Mormon admitted to me, he said, he adds, that he has been baptized over 5,000 times for the dead. For the dead. I can truly say this, first of all, that baptism for the dead, such as death, is not biblical. 
But many of them just use this verse alone. Alone and dwell in it alone. And to say like, yes, that's what it means that we can be baptized. We can baptize someone for the dead. There's some other teachings also that you can also pray for the dead. That he or she will go to heaven. There is no evidence of that in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 says that it is appointed unto men once to die. After death, judgment. In other words, after the death of a physical death of a person, there is no, nothing else can be done. It is already appointed unto men once to die. After death, judgment. So baptism before, a baptism for the dead, it does not affect the dead. That by itself is already speaking out loud that that belief is not right, is false. The Bible only speaks of one baptism, that is believer's baptism. Most of you here have been baptized. And I want you to remember what is the significance of your baptism. Why is it that the Lord Jesus Christ, He went into the water by John the Baptist, baptized in the Jordan River, a very murky water. Amy and I, we went there this last year in February. And the water was so disgusting. It was brown, like, yeah, like a clay brown. And in there, there they believed that was the spot where Jesus was baptized. So there were bus after bus after buses who just lining up in their people. There are many uh, Russian Orthodox even. They went there with the white a gown, you know, and went into the water and they bathed themselves like that and they just say whatever they were speaking and they come out and they go going inside again to wash themselves, washing again. One of the one of the speakers, one of the, the uh, tour guides that was there mentioning in regards of many people believe that when they go into this water that their sin has been washed away again and again and again. Some of them even doing that as a pilgrimage a journey every year. They go in there to wash their sin away. Some people even trying to bring the water. <laughs> it won't pass to come to New Zealand, I'll tell you that. It's so nasty. The Lord Jesus Christ went in there. It's not for salvation because He is God. He, he was perfect. There is no sin to be washed away. But you remember that He went into that water because it was something that was required of Him. In obedience to his father, because he came as a man, as a bond servant, just like us in a way, yet without sin. He came into the water because he wants to identify himself with God the Father. Remember the incident that took place that he went into the water, the Bible says, and when he came out of the water, that's what we believe that baptism means to be immersed, not sprinkled. He went and he came out of the water, and then what happened? The Bible says that the sky was open. And the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove, which is looked like a bird, like a dove. But it's not a bird, like in the many movies. And then the Holy Spirit rests upon him. So there was God the Son, God the Spirit. And then the voice from heaven of God the Father, and he spoke, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In other words, that this man right here, this Son of God, Jesus Christ, is with me we are one one and then whatever he is and whatever he does it is of god the father not of himself <clears throat> and that is important for us to know that because when we get baptized after we come to know the lord jesus christ as lord and savior as the evidence of your true belief of your true faith in jesus christ that your faith is a living faith that is for you and me for us to obey god in following the lord's baptism so that we be identified with god with jesus christ that jesus christ and i be one we are now one that's the significance one of the significance of baptism, water baptism. It's important. However, water baptism is not for salvation. But salvation is for baptism. Do you understand that? In other words, that your baptism does not save you. 
If you remember the scripture, there are many places that, um, especially in, in the book of Acts and all through the Old, uh, New Testament, you find that many people, believers, being baptized. But there was one man that, are, that was in paradise, who was in heaven, that was never been baptized. That man was on the cross with our Lord Jesus Christ. He was the man that believed of the Son of God and he said, Lord, remember me when you go into paradise. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, today you shall be with me in paradise. That man never had a chance to go into the water to be baptized. That man is in heaven. I'm actually looking forward to meet with him because there is no name mentioned of who he was. But after I met with the Lord Jesus Christ, after I met with all the apostles and all of that, uh, I want to meet with this man. I want to ask the Lord Jesus Christ, can you introduce me to that man? I want to see him. I really like to see him, to have a chat with him, to know his experience. The Lord Jesus Christ have made this ordinance, this this very baptism. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two ordinances the Lord Jesus Christ gave. That is for the reality of our life with Christ. As Christians, we cannot miss that baptism and we cannot miss out the Lord's Supper. Those two are very important to the Lord Jesus Christ and it should be very important to us too. And by the way, if you're here today, and uh, you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've never been baptized. You need to think about that if you really truly really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have been here and you have perhaps part of the church before, they're not really preaching of the truth of the wholesome of the Word of God. Your baptism did not count because the baptism only can be count for those who are those who are truly believe in the Word of God, in the Word of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know your background, so this is between you and the Lord. Between you and the Lord. I'm not trying to make you doubt, but, well, if you're still alive here, make sure that you are truly being baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ in the like faith, the church like faith. All right? So here's the thing. Go back to that verse 29. We look, we look at what baptism does, but what does that mean? Now, I want to get your thinking cap right now. I want to take you to a Bible class, if you don't mind, this morning. Just really quick. Look at that verse again, verse 29. When it begins, say, what will they do who are baptized? Look at that word, for the dead. For the dead. The word for in there, in the original text of the Bible, is hooper, or hopper, whatever you want to pronounce it, H-U-P-E-R. Is a, the Greek word that has so many different meanings. It depends on how the text is written and to also in the effect of the whole context of that passage. Now we know that the context in this chapter talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you read that text, the chapter 15, and in conjunction with other verses in the Bible, especially in the epistles of the Apostle Paul, like the book of Colossians and the book of Philippians, you're going to find out that word for in there also can be translated into the word because of because of so look at that verse again when it says that what will they do where is that verse going to that i put it in there so you can underline that the next one in that verse it says what will they do who are baptized for the dead but then now it says who what will they do who are baptized because of the dead. Go to the next one then, please. Because of the dead. In other words, what Paul, 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 Paul said, this is one thing that I believe to be the closest one to interpret this verse. There are other ones as well that are quite legitimate and almost look like close one. But I believe this is what Paul's talking about because Paul was talking about later on in verse 31 and 30 to verse 34 is in the conjunction with the testimony of believers, of Christians. So Paul was saying here is that there are people that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ now 
because of those who have been baptized in Jesus Christ and have died. Do you understand that? I am here today because there was a man that was once followed the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism and preached the word of God or taught me or shared the word of God with me. And not just because I didn't see Pastor John being baptized. I've never seen him being baptized in the water. But I seen his baptism as he lived in Christ and Christ lives in him. I know that he, beyond the shadow of the doubt, that he and Jesus Christ are one. I know that. Do you see what I mean in there? People may not see you being baptized into the water, but they can see you if you are one with Christ. They can testify that baptism, the immersion of your life, the two become one. You are in Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you see that? Magnified. The Lord Jesus Christ will be magnified in my body, in my life, either to life or death. This is what Paul said in verse 29, 1 Corinthians 15, that there are many who have died in Christ, that were baptized or been united with the Lord Jesus Christ, who have affected the life of now people that are in Christ because of that. But look at the text, the verse again, continue with this says. If the dead do not rise at all, if the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is not real, then those baptisms means nothing and those people's believers in vain. That's what Paul was saying. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and baptism. Baptism is your it's a, your symbol of submission to God. Do you know that every time, I don't, you know, I don't see this with the naked eyes, but every time someone truly believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, and when someone goes into the water to be baptized, do you know that God is present and He testified that? And that baptism is more than just you getting wet. It's more than just you feeling good about the water. That baptism to God, it means that you are now with me, are one. We are one. As Jesus Christ says in John 15, I abide, abide in me and I abide in you. Live in me and I live in you. Christians, think about this. You who are truly been born again and baptized, think about this. God the Father, the living God, the creator God, when you went into that water, you have testified to God, first and most of all, that you have become one with Him. And God sealed that by His Spirit. The moment when you call upon Jesus Christ, before even you're baptized, that is already done. But the baptism to God means everything also. Like example, your wedding. Does it mean anything to you? Or is it just to have a party and waste money, thousands of dollars. <laughs> I'm so glad that I didn't spend too, many, too much money on my wedding. <laughs> just a few hundred dollars. Some people spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars just for one day. I would rather buy a house with a thousand and thousands of dollars and live happily ever after with my wife, right? <laughs> but why is it so big? Why is it people so crazy about the wedding? Because it's a very significant moment of that couple's life when the two become one. And I'm not going to stop you if you're going to have million dollars of weddings as long as you give to God million dollars also. <laughs> Otherwise it's just all about you, right? I'm not joking about that, by the way. It is true. That baptism is our submission to God. When we go into the water, we say to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, I'm submitting myself to you that you are my God, my Lord, 
and my Savior. And now, and I go into that water, I identify, I are together, you and me, we're together, crucified, 